Hello and welcome to the Unfuck Your Biz podcast, a show for creatives to encourage and inspire through actionable legal, tax, money, and business topics. I'm Braden Drake, an author, lawyer, tax pro, and educator. If you are ready to get your legal and tax shit legit, you are in the right place. But before we fully dive in, here is a quick word from my sponsors. This episode is brought to you by my private podcast, Braden's Besties. Did you know that I created a second podcast? It is exclusive only to members of the Braden's Besties Facebook group. If you have not already joined, go to www.bradensbesties.com where you can get signed up. Once you join the Facebook group, you will get access to a private podcast where I answer your questions from our Facebook group every single Monday. The episodes are five to 10 minutes long, super bite-sized, so you can dive in, get answers to the biggest questions you may have, and that's it, pretty straightforward. So go join the group, bradensbesties.com, and I will see you both here and over there on the Braden's Besties podcast. Well, hello there, and welcome back to the podcast. As always, this is your host, Brayden, and today I'm joined by a fellow attorney, Rob Shank, owner of WeddingIndustryLaw.com. Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. We're, we are going to talk today about some interesting kind of legal areas. We're going to touch on contracts, but really dive into a topic that I haven't addressed too much on the podcast here. And I also want to let everyone know... Um, Rob is pretty well niched into the wedding industry. Obviously, your domain name is WeddingIndustryLaw.com. Um, I work with a lot of wedding industry professionals, but more generally with creatives. And I want to let you all know that what we're going to talk about today is going to be highly relevant really to all business owners, but particularly like service-based small business owners. So Rob, can you start us out and just tell us a little bit about your background? Like, I'm curious where you went to law school. And then also, like, what was your first... Um, job in the legal field after that? Uh, I uh, went to Georgia State Law, came to Atlanta, graduated from Georgia State Law in 2008. Um, I, uh, at that time, I was dating a professional wedding photographer. So I got into the, uh, like that kind of, that, that industry, at least within Atlanta, within wedding photographers, and then looking at those contracts and things like that. Um, kind of, got known in the, in the wedding photography community in Atlanta, and then got a kind of like a speaking tour, got, you know, started a blog. And so that kind of blossomed into representing, you know, venue owners and operators, you know, um, florists and that kind of stuff. But yes, yeah, that's, I've never been asked what was my first job out of law school with, but that was at a first amendment law firm, a very famous first amendment law firm in Atlanta that represents all the strip club, well, not all of them, most of the good dirty strip clubs <laughs> and adult bookstores in Atlanta. They're always busy because there's um, a lot of representatives and city council members, city council members trying to shut those places down. Interesting. Yeah. I could imagine Georgia's like down there on the Bible belt, belt. So it's probably like a push, push pull with all that kind of stuff. Yeah. First amendment law would not be my jam. I like just scraped by in constitutional law and then learned what I had to learn to pass the bar exam. So I have to, I, whenever I explain this to non attorneys or law graduates, they don't really they get what I'm talking about, but I learned pretty early in law school that I did not really enjoy reading case law. Like the longer the cases, the less I enjoyed it. And for those of you who don't know, constitutional law cases are famously lengthy because every single judge has an opinion that they like has a dissenting opinion they want to get in, right? Isn't that how it usually works? That is absolutely how it works. And I'll do you one better and that everybody's like, well, I want to be a constitutional lawyer, not realizing that they're thinking first amendment, second amendment, yeah. abortion, pro-life, this type of stuff. When in reality, 90% of con law is like, does Congress have the power to do this legislation? Does the administrative board have the, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is the most boring stuff I've ever seen in my yeah, life. Yeah, see, so. interestingly, those are the things I would be more interested in because like, <laughs> I always thought I wanted to work in policy, like healthcare policy to be specific. But this is why I, I ended up getting into tax because I had a professor who was like, oh, if you like reading statutory law, you should just go into tax because there are cases, but you know, the cases are more ancillary to the primary source. So anyhow, we won't bore you with that whole discussion. Rob and I, like next time in Georgia, I'm in Georgia, we can go get a drink and talk about that. Um, 
Okay, so you got into the wedding industry, super cool. And you shared with me that before we hit record that you have a background, that you do have a background in litigation. Can you explain to my audience like what the word litigation means and then also what your background specifically was? Yes. So my I, when I graduated after the first moment place, I, I went to work at a, a law firm, an international business litigation law firm. It's based in Paris. So like, um, you know, they represented a lot of French companies and, and high net worth French citizens in the United States. Um, and so that's kind of that's where I started in, in litigation and, 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 and things of that nature. But litigation is just um, we don't live in the Wild West anymore. So when we have conflict, particularly business conflict with one another, we don't, you know, take it to the down square and, and duel it out. We have to go through the courts of law. So if somebody, you know, the person over there owes me money. I can't go shake them down anymore. I've got to file a lawsuit for whatever the theory is that that person owes me money for, and then it gets adjudicated either by a judge or a jury. And so the litigation process is the process by which we receive or, or achieve that outcome of, of a judge or a jury issuing us that recovery against that person that owes us the money. That's litigation in a nutshell, it's that process. Yeah, so when people like to give you all an example, when people come to me, I get emails in my inbox that's like, hey, my client won't pay me or my client's threatening to sue me for whatever reason. Oftentimes it's tough for me because I consider myself to be a transactional attorney, which is the opposite side of lit litigation. So I say, oh, I can do a consultation with you, maybe give you some tips. But if it gets to the point where a lawsuit's actually going to be filed, I'm going to re refer you to a litigation attorney because they handle the lawsuits. Do you do litigation in your current practice or is it just education and transactional very, stuff? Just mostly transactional stuff. And I'll tell you why it's because typically, unless the, 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 the case, unless the contract issue that, that it's, cause it's usually a contract issue that someone's approached by just like you, like, Hey, somebody's not paying me or somebody's canceled and they're just going to sue me because of COVID or whatever. Typically, the amount of time, effort, and money it would take to get the recovery that you're seeking outweighs what you would pay me yeah. to get it. So it's kind of like the, it's like all those ridiculous movies that have been coming out for the past 10 years. We have the old dude. It's like, I got to go back into war one last time, except I'm not, I don't want to go back into war one last time. It's not worth uh -huh. it, right? Like I'm not going to go back into my room and open up my chest and there's my gun and I'm going to go get justice for somebody. It's just the process uh, the process shuts most people out unless the value is at such a level where it 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 the cost benefit makes sense for the most part. Yeah, and but I think sometimes I do though. Sometimes I do. Yeah, I think it, it's so interesting because we both serve the same market. Where oftentimes, like the vast majority of people I'm helping are signing anywhere from like two to ten thousand dollar contracts. Mm -hmm. So there's not enough money on the line typically for litigation to actually make any logical sense. But sometimes those people have very illogical clients. Usually those clients, like one of the parties that are getting married, typically what I see is they have like an uncle or a sister who's an attorney and they're like, we're going to sue you. And what I found is it puts them in a hard spot because then you might have to spend a lot of money to defend yourself. And a lot of like traditional litigation practices don't really serve this market. So it's tough. But that seems to be a very, very rare occurrence. Like most things can be solved amicably. So with that in mind, I do want to talk a little bit about the different areas of law. So specifically, we're going to talk about torts versus contracts. Um, can you tell my audience what the hell a tort is, first of all? Sure. So a tort, quite simply, is just a civil wrong, not a criminal wrong, but a civil wrong that causes injury to someone else. So torts come in different flavors. So there, you know, you've heard of the word defamation, which is uh, a, a, an utterance that's false that ruins somebody's reputation. That's a tort. Or you just go outside, look at the side of the of the interstate or the freeway or whatever you call them in, in Southern California or in Northern California and look at the billboards. That's personal injury as a tort. Like if you, if you negligently cause a wreck, you've committed the tort of negligence. So these are just, I guess, for lack of a better word, legal theories that you would need to put forward in a lawsuit in order to get recovery from someone else. Um, with regard to, uh, to your audience that's listening, the creatives out there, the, the reason why you would want to know at least the basics about what torts are 
is because of the recovery that would be allowed under the theory of, of torts, like the theory of negligence, the theory of intentional infliction of emotional distress, fraud or misrepresentation versus a typical breach of contract case. So like if you get sued for breach of contract, which is to say you didn't do what you promised to do. Maybe you did, the pictures were crappy or uh, you were really mean and didn't deliver what you were supposed to, these type of things, right? Or you're late. Typically your business can survive these things because the law limits typically the amount of money that the plaintiff, the person that's suing you, that couple, the terrible person that's suing your business, um, it's gonna limit them to typically within contract value, okay? There are some instances in which they can get a little bit more, but at the end of the day, this is kind of stuff that you can survive. Mm -hmm. it's, the, I, it's the idea of these torts, the recovery that's allowable in torts can be highly, I don't, I don't know, like it's, it's not something that's easily quantifiable. Um, one of the first cases that I litigated when I was a, 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 out on my own doing business litigation for the, for the wedding industry, I actually represented the couple, not the, not the professional, the wedding professional. And so um, this was, long story short, this was a, a wedding photographer that um, essentially at the end of the day, he probably lost the, the footage, but he lied to the, to the bride and groom about what happened to it. So a year goes by, they have no pictures, they have no videography. Um, and then he comes up with the excuse of, well, um, you hired me to take shots of the bride and not the groom for the, for the, so that's why there's no pictures of the groom getting ready or the groom's family, the weird things, a bunch of lies. So we sued, okay, um, under the theory of breach of contract because he didn't fulfill the, the, the obligations, right? Then we also sued under the theory of fraud, which is a, which is for lack of a better term, a business tort here in Georgia, which is you made misrepresentations to get the people to come into the contract and also intentional affliction, emotional stress. So at the end of the day, we got a recovery under breach of contract for X amount. Okay. Whatever the contract was worth, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so let's just, if in this situation, let's just say the contract was 5,000. I don't remember what it was, but we got $5,000 because they got zero value out of the contract they paid $5,000 for, but we got four or five times that. Okay. in damages because of the misrepresentation and the intentional affliction of emotional distress, these tort damages can be much higher if the plaintiff can paint you in a really bad, in a really bad light. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in that case, you had the misrepresentation or the fraud claim, and you were saying that they, your argument was that there were misrepresentations basically made to induce the party to sign the contract. Do you remember, or are you able to share what you argued those misrepresentations were? Yeah. So the long, I mean, it, it's like this. So I, I'm sure this person is a, is a good person, the photographer. Okay. And they just got in over their head, but like, so there were misrepresentations at the beginning because the contract says, I'm going to take pictures of your wedding. And then it's not until a year later when they're like, where are the pictures? Is he saying, oh, well, the contract doesn't say, you know, bride, groom or whatever. That's, that's a misrepresentation, right? So I'm not saying that they're, you know, miscommunication is not going to be misrepresentation. You have to, in order to be successful in a case like that, like for us, you have to paint a whole picture. So it wasn't just that. I can't, I can't recall every single one, but there was probably a dozen lies that he made. Some of them yeah. before the contract, some of them after, which allowed us to say he never intended to produce the, 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 the photographs. Um, gotcha. So that, that's, that's kind of what, that's kind of what it was about. Yeah, because what, what I was wondering is if he made misrepresentations before the party signed. So that would be, you know, if you do like an initial meeting with your client and you're just blowing like all kinds of smoke about your ability to deliver, maybe I can see, I've actually seen this online in Facebook groups of people showing photos of other people's portfolios. That would definitely be misrepresentation. Yeah. If you're trying yeah. to land a big client. That's exactly right. And, and not this particular case, but there is case law to support that where if the, if the, if the, potential client comes in and you're avant-garde black and white east german television style photojournalist and but you show them you know plain jane photography to get them to 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 do that that's actually what's called fraud and the inducement 
which mm-hmm. is different than fraud after the fact, but it's all, it's all the kind of the same, but you're absolutely right that, that your, your messaging needs to be consistent. I'm not saying that everybody, you got to make sure that everything is on point, but yeah, as a whole, like make sure that you're. Yeah. And to get, I mean, to kind of wrap, like wrap that up and keep it simple for everyone. Like we don't want everyone to get too like freaked out about these different things. The main takeaway here is like, you just need, you just need to be able to deliver whatever it is that you're marketing, right? So show representative representative samples of your work. It's not, you know, too much, and don't lie. Also, and, and, don't, and don't lie. And so, and that's kind of like in in that because it's not just fraud. There's other things like the intentional infliction, of emotional distress, negligent infliction, um, th- these type of things. But the idea here is, at least in my experience, and and this could be your experience as well, but um, it, it's better for the professional not to hide the ball. Mm-hmm. So if you've, if you've messed up, you have to own it and be like, what can I do to make this right? Because if you hide the ball or you, you know, or you lie, then it's easier for somebody like me or an attorney to paint you as the enemy that you didn't intend to be. So that's kind of what I would say is in terms of behavior modification is always be upfront if you can. But how do you coach people through, like, they're likely going to have the concern so they're like, well, I don't want to lie, but I also don't like willing, I don't want to willingly admit in writing that I fucked up because then that could also be used against me. Like, is there a middle ground between that or do you just have to own it? Well, I mean, and I'm so glad that we can cuss on this because that's, that's fantastic. So, um, <laughs> yes, well, I look, and I'm not giving legal advice, however, of course, yeah. however, um, typically if you are up front and say, how can I make this better? Like, so for example, let's just say for the sake of this example, you didn't, you didn't, you lost, I don't know how people take photographs anymore. Let's say that you lost a car. Do people still use cards like the little SD card? Yeah, they still use cards. Actually, I had a, had a friend who posted in a Facebook group the other day about having to have all of her film x-rayed because she still photographs on film. And she was really worried about the damage. So we could use rolls. Of, if someone lost a roll of film, that would be a really Perfect. clear example. Perfect. So, okay. So in that, let's say that that roll, whatever roll of film was lost, let's say that that was like the first three hours of the event. Okay. So we still have, you know, 75% of the event. So if that, that photographer goes, look, this is my fault. I own it. It's no excuse, but I've lost 25%, 30% of the, the film. Um, here is what I can do for you. I can, mm-hmm. I can take a certain amount off. I can, you know, I'll photograph all of your future children's, you know, weddings or what, whatever. <laughs> if, if you, if you say I messed up and you give them a value proposition and they accept it again, I'm not giving legal advice, but typically what that, what happens is that you have now amended the contract. You've now sometimes, sometimes it's called a court and satisfaction. Sometimes it's called amendment addendum. Doesn't matter. The idea is I fucked up. Yes. Now you have the right to sue me because I fucked up or I'm giving you something to take so that we can bypass that whole situation and just go forward amicably. And if you do that, that is going to typically waive their right to sue you about it. So they can't take your deal and sue you because they didn't get what they were supposed to get. That's not possible after they've taken your offer. Does that make sense? Yeah, I usually, and I usually recommend that people do a release agreement in that case. I think oh, that, yeah, yeah yes. I make it like extra clear. So oftentimes it's like a one page document. It's basically, hey, um, I'm giving you this thing in exchange for you not suing me. <laughs> that's basically that's what the that contract says. That, that's exactly right. It's it's a settlement agreement or whatever. Because you because once you do that, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can you can say, hey, keep this confidential. You can don't 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 you know d- disparage me on the internet. Whatever you want, you can do a lot of that stuff at that point. Yeah. Okay, so I want to um I want to talk about intentional infliction of emotional distress because you mentioned that um not something that I really spent much time thinking about since I studied for the bar exam and had to memorize all those elements. But, and I want to get, I'll give an example here so we can run with a hypothetical. Let's say a wedding planner uh, has a client who is supposed to have a wedding in a month or two, and they decide to preemptively cancel the event because they're worried about the Delta variant of COVID. Um, this sounds like it could be a real example. It could turn into a real example, but it's purely hypothetical. Um, and this client now, um, sorry, 
opposite. Wedding planner cancels the event. Client wants to sue. Okay. Client wants to sue for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Is that a valid claim or what does that look like? Can you tell us a little bit about what that cause of action is all about? Sorry, so, that was like 18 questions, but we'll just- No, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And it gives, me, it gives me the opportunity to say that there's no crying in contracts. So without, without getting super like esoteric, without getting like putting people to sleep, typically when you have a situation in which someone has been damaged because of a breach of a contract, mm -hmm. almost always the recovery allowable for that person is breach of contract damages, okay? Which we, we, we talked about is you don't get like the, the pain and suffering damages like you would in a tort, you only get contract damages. So the only way for somebody to get extra double dip from the tort based solely on a contract claim, like you didn't do what you're supposed to, there has to be um, excessively poor behavior on the part of the professional. So not just I'm canceling the contract, but um, I'm doing something that's so egregious that it causes you truly psychological with physical symptoms problems. Mm -hmm. So some case law um, presents where, um, and I can't remember what case this is, but um, the photographer took a deposit and met with the client originally, didn't show up to the wedding. And so the, the, there's breach of contract there. Okay. So mm -hmm. that would be, that would be for the, for the, for the bride breach of contract damages. However, she goes back and confronts the photographer at the, at the office of the photographer. And the photographer's like, I've never met you in my life. Get out of here and calls the cops on her. And so now you not only have the breach of contract, but you have an, you have in, you have behavior independent of the obligations of the contract, which give rise to intentional infliction of emotional stress, which infliction, to intentional infliction of emotional stress to answer the original question is, and I can't remember offhand, even though I took the bar a hundred times, it's, it's essentially egregious behavior that causes psychological and psychological problems that manifest physically and every jurisdiction has different rules about what that actually means. But just think of it this way. It has to be super bad behavior that causes somebody to have some type of reaction. And in the case that I talked about with the case law, it was like irritable bowel syndrome for like six months. She had to go to see a psychiatrist. It was, it was pretty, she had, she brought the evidence. Yeah, we had, I remember when I took tort, tort law in law school, our professor, he was like an 84 year old from Boston. He'd been teaching at our law school for, I think like 45 years. And it would always come down to, we'd have to write our essays and it would always come down to, well, what's deemed outrageous. And for us non-attorney friends, that's what we learn how to do in law school. You write an essay and it's not always that you have the right or wrong answer. It's that you argue what your position is. So I just Googled elements of intentional infliction of emotional distress. And for reference for everyone, this is through the Cornell Law School. So these are generally like the kind of the generic rules we learn for the bar exam, not specific legal like uh, laws in particular states. But it says the defendant's act is the defendant's acts and their conduct is so outrageous that they cause the emotional distress. So outrageous, egregious, that's what we're looking at. So Rob, what I'm wondering is I have seen wedding professionals get sued and causes of act, there's causes of action for contract, breach of contract, but it seems pretty reasonable. And then I always see intentional infliction of emotional distress. And I personally don't really ever see outrageous conduct there. Would you agree with my statement that a lot of plaintiff's attorneys just like throw that on because they want to kind of like argue everything? And oftentimes it's not really a reasonable argument. I would say you're 100% right. <laughs> um, for, the, for, for the exact reason is that typically if, if the, if the, if the problem arises from breach of contract, typically you're not going to be able to get these other torts unless you have evidence of that crazy outrageous behavior, which you almost never do. Intentional infliction, emotional distress, particularly in the South 
is one of those things where nobody believes that it it, it exists like yeah because, because it's psychological and if you know unless you can look at a broken arm okay oh, it's, got, it's got a broken arm but psychological i mean they still probably don't believe in psychiatry and you know in, in in georgia still so like depending on what jurisdiction you're in you might not you still might not even be able to bring the claim so but yes it's usually bullshit yeah i feel like i could sum this yeah i feel like i could sum this up with the idea of like breaching your contract, making a, a mistake, making a professional mistake might make you a little bit negligent or careless, or open you up to a breach of contract claim, but it doesn't make you an asshole. We generally all know an asshole when we see one. So as long as you're not doing that, you're generally going to be off the hook from these tort claims. But that doesn't mean that if you have a very unreasonable person suing you, that they're going to try to sue you for everything. So that's what a lot of plaintiff's attorneys do. They file what we call a complaint with the court, and in their complaint, they're going to list all the reasons why they're suing you. These are the causes of action. They're probably going to pick like eight to 10 of them, and one of those might be reasonable. But if you if this ever happens to you, I just like to let people know, like, don't read all of that and immediately freak out. Like, you might, you probably need to go get some legal counsel, but, you know, you can rebut a lot of them. Fair enough. Okay. Yes. So let's talk about some contract tips. So my first question is, obviously, when it comes to breach of contract, you just have to have a good contract and you need to abide by your contract, right? Is there anything that you can put in your contract that limits your liability with regard to, I guess, breaching your own contract? There are a couple of things that I would recommend. Uh, the first one is just the concept of the limited liability provision or the limited liability clause. Limited liability clause basically just says that we're both going to agree the parties are going to agree that this is an arm's length transaction and that i'm not going to be um, uh, responsible for any type of unforeseeable type of damages and so the example that i always give is again we'll go back to the wedding photographer is i'm taking wedding photography okay that's what i'm assuming is going on and so if i don't do a good job then you're going the damages are going to be limited to whatever it is and most of the time it's going to be the the price that's paid under the contract mm -hmm. so that way they they can't come back to you and go we were going to enter those pictures into some contest where we were going to win 10 million dollars and because we can't enter that contest we're suing you for 10 million dollars and you're saying you're like there's no way i could have known that you're going to enter that contest for 10 million dollars so that's kind of the that's kind of the the reason why you would have the limited liability provision that's not going to be something that keeps you out of all trouble like you can't go and punch the person in the face and go here's your money back limited liability bitch you can't do that um so that's going to help you from most i would say breach of contract damage actions with regard to preventing um kind of the, the tort actions you have the indemnity clause and the indemnity clause is just a way to try to shift the risk of loss in particular losses from one party to the other. So by way of example, you can say, look, um, if you're a, ve a venue operator or whatever, it doesn't even matter. You can, you say, look, um, this is a public event or this is a, an event that's happening in public and there's going to be people. It's going to be lots of people. There's going to be probably infectious disease. We got COVID, Delta, Lambda, 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 it doesn't matter. You are assuming the risk of coming on to this property and participating in this wedding. So to the extent that somebody gets hurt, you are going to indemnify me, meaning that you are going to um, not hold me responsible. And if I do get sued as the defendant, you're going to step into my place and defend me. So that's kind of the idea is that you're you're pushing some tort claims that might be brought against you over to the client who has to protect you and do what's called indemnify you and in some in some instances hold you harmless. That's super esoteric. That's super like um, I'm not even sure if I'm using the esoteric word right. Like I'm saying that's <laughs> yeah, I get I mean I get a lot of questions about indemnification. It's I mean it's really confusing. The way I always the way I always tell people to think about it is when you have an indemnification clause, basically you're saying, hey, if someone comes sues me, you agree that it's not my fault and you're gonna cover my ass if and when that happens. Um, when it comes to indemnification and limitation of liability, some states allow more than other states, meaning some states will allow you to limit your liability a lot more, like the southern states typically will allow you to do that because they're a lot more business friendly out here in California, we're more consumer friendly. It's really just how 
I mean, it's the push and pull of like liberal versus conservative politics often is mirrored in these types of laws. Do you ever see, okay, let me try to frame my question better here. I've seen contract templates that have um, fairly weak provisions when it comes to these terms. And I've seen contracts that are very, very strict and harsh on the client. Do you think there's ever a problem where people need to be concerned that they're the templated provisions they're using are too strict, meaning like too favorable towards the business? Yeah, that's that's certainly possible. So the, the issue here, and, and to give you an example, it would be some states do not allow you to indemnif be indemnified for your own gross negligence yeah. or intentional conduct, right? So like it's a difference of like if I'm walking around with a steak knife, um, you know, and I'm like waving it around, that could be considered negligence. And in some states, I might be able to um, be indemnified for that behavior. In some states, not. Now, add I'm drinking, and that's gross negligence. And so there are very few states that will allow you to be indemnified for your own gross negligent behavior. No state that I'm aware of would allow you to, if, to be indemnified for your intentional conduct. So if you literally just stab somebody, yeah. you, can never, you can almost never do that. So to, to answer your question directly, understanding those different kind of sub, sub, subcategories, there are some states that, that I know of that it's having an invalid indemnification clause, meaning going too hard, like, oh man, I'm, I'm indemnifying, I'm being indemnified for anything that I do and my people, that could result in the judge ripping the entire contract up. It could result in that whole section being blue, like blue pen, or kind of voided out or just that part being blue penciled. So depending on what jurisdiction you're in, that could have some ramifications. So you want to make sure that your indemnification clause is drafted correctly because in the event that a judge wants to rip your whole contract up because of it, that could really hurt you because, you know, theoretically your contract is helping you. So if that gets cut up, it's not good for you. So um, this is a very niche question. And some of you may follow along with this. Some of you may not. That's okay. You just follow as much as you can. But in the case that you have a severability clause, so severability clause basically states, if one of my provisions is deemed to be unenforceable, the rest of them will still stand. Do judges always honor that? So if you have an indemnification clause that's overly broad and you also have a severability clause, will they then just throw out that indemnification provision or can they still toss the whole contract in their own discretion? I've personally not been in, a, in litigation where that's been the case. However, case law, um, it, in my experience of my research, is that if there is a statute that says that you have to void the contract, then I don't think it's in the judge's discretion. Gotcha. However, in my but but in my experiences, judges pretty much do whatever they want, and so you know you're probably not going to appeal that decision. And so <laughs> who, who knows? Is, yeah, is, and this I mean, is this is one of those examples where this is why you'll often hear attorneys say work with an attorney in your state. Mm -hmm. um, which is always a great idea, but also if you're working off of a contract template, there are a number of provisions that people need to look at. I think indemnification is a big one, limitation of liability, um, things like non-compete agreements, but those are usually an independent contractor agreements. Here in California, the other one that really is ever an issue is, um, what's the legal term I'm looking for? Basically the, the provision that would determine whether someone can write you negative reviews. Oh word. yeah, the Yelp, the Yelp law. You can't do that in California. Yeah, you can't. Basically, you can't have a provision in your contract that says your clients are not uh, not allowed, allowed to, to you write better. you negative reviews. Exactly. Um, so those are like the three big ones. And I would, I mean, I would think that you kind of divided them into buckets earlier when it comes to indemnification. There's uh, states that don't allow you to get indemnification for negligent misconduct. Those that don't allow, and those that don't allow gross misconduct. So you could probably Google which of these camps your state falls into and then make sure that your provision has the correct language. I, I mean, that's not all too complicated. Yeah, I agree. So, okay. yeah, cool. Um, I mean, you know, I always tell people if you're a brand new business owner and you get a really solid template, you can probably just uh, self audit it. If you're at the point where you have a company where you have several associates and you're booking out 50 events a year and you haven't already had a local attorney look at your contract, it's probably past time. So just 
be reasonable when it comes to that kind of stuff. All right, so let's talk about insurance for a moment. So obviously you're not an insurance agent, but there's a lot of overlap between insurance and torts. What I'm really curious about in the most simple terms is when it comes to professional liability insurance and general liability insurance, well, most policies cover all sorts of contract claims and tort claims or just one or the other, or is it entirely policy-based? Yeah, I think that I think that when you're talking about general liability insurance, it's typically going to be when somebody like breaks their leg and needs, yeah. you know, needs surgeries. And so, yes, that's what general liability is for. So if your company has general liability insurance and you in fact hurt somebody or one of your people hurt somebody, that's what that's for. If you breach a contract, your general liability insurance is probably not going to cover that. That's that is going to be covered by some type of malpractice or professional um, yeah. insurance, which I don't think is, I mean, typically that professional insurance is for, for persons that have like a licensed, you know, profession, like attorneys, architects, you know, engineers, that kind of stuff. You can still get it um, for if you're, if, a, if you're a planner, coordinator, if you're, you know, a venue operator or something like that. I think it's cheap, um, but that, that's, what, that's the type of insurance I would imagine that you're going to, to need. Okay, to, yeah, to I mean, I recommend... I recommend professional liability insurance to everyone. This is something I chatted on the podcast about last week with the insurance agent as we kind of talked about, that's kind of the nuance between professional liability insurance is for licensed professionals, whereas sometimes you call it errors and emissions insurance, the same thing for non-licensed professionals. It doesn't really matter. What I'm wondering, and you might not be able to answer this question, which is totally fine. Um, something that I could ask my insurance friend is if you have that, breach of contract case with the cancellation, and there is that really egregious conduct, which would make you liable to some tort claims like intentional infliction of emotional distress. Is your professional liability insurance going to cover, like, is your professional going to, Jesus, is your insurance going to cover that? Or are they going to say no, because it's an intentional tort and we don't cover those? Um, if, well, intentional infliction of emotional stress, misrepresentation, fraud, and the inducement are all intentional torts. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know the answer to that. If your policy doesn't cover intentional torts, then I don't see how it could, it could cover those, but I, that would be the, I'm going to tune in to your, your podcast with <laughs> okay. the insurance. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave this as the question mark where this is something for you all to ask your own insurance brokers. Um, do you cover negligence, errors and emissions? Do you cover torts, specifically intentional torts? I actually am pretty sure the answer is no, because I'm reflecting back to my experience interning uh, mm -hmm. at a plaintiff's law firm. And I remember a t an attorney basically saying, I was like, because I was in my first semester of torts. Well, isn't that an intentional tort? Because the person did that thing on purpose. And the response wasn't the academic answer I expected. The response was more of, insurance doesn't cover that we always sue for negligence <laughs> oh that's 100 percent. i mean like no one's yeah. gonna no plaintiff's attorney is gonna take a case if there's not money at the end of the day and there's right. never money there unless there's an insurance policy that's going to cover it absolutely yes so i think that kind of gives me my own answer as i'm reflecting back on that all right so we've discussed a lot as we wrap up here any other like practical tips or considerations we haven't touched on specifically when it comes to just kind of protecting yourself from either a breach of contract or any kind of tort cases? I think that just to sum up that if, if you want to protect yourself from those egregious torts, number one, have, you know, be, be humble and, and admit when you're wrong. If you want to protect yourself from, you know, the, the torts of like people breaking their legs or you walking around with a knife and drop it on somebody's foot, have that liability insurance do what Braden says, which is have an LLC, make sure that you've, you've got layers of protection. Um, and in terms of, of breach of contract actions, um, having limited liability, having an identification clause, I think those are going to be the, the main things that are going to protect you from 95% of what gets thrown at you. Beautiful. Okay, great summary. So the way I always wrap up my podcast, as my audience knows, I have a Facebook group called Braden's Besties. You should all go join www.bradensbesties.com. I also am now doing a private podcast episode every week for my Facebook group members. So everyone go subscribe to that. 
uh, or go join the Facebook group so you can get access. Rob, if people want to become one of your besties, what's the best way for them to do that? Where should they follow you and get all your information? Um, go to weddingindustrylaw.com. Um, holler at me there. Uh, a Instagram, I'm at wedding lawyer. If you want to um, DM me or, or follow me there, I think those are the best ways. Just um, fill in the little intake form on weddingindustrylaw.com. It's a terrible website. It's like my website is kind of <laughs> like, I, you're, you're a young man. I don't know if you remember GeoCities, like like the very first like websites. Yeah, this is like 1997 or something like that. But like it was free websites. You got one meg of data to work with. And that's what my website is. It's basically a GeoCities website. Okay, well, I got a lot of web designers in my audience. So you uh, might end up getting some unsolicited pitches in your inbox. There we go. I'll take it. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Hey there, before you go, I wanted to give a quick thanks. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. If you loved it, I would love for you to take a screenshot of the episode or snap a quick selfie while you are listening. Share it on social and give me a tag. It'll help other kick-ass entrepreneurs like yourself find the show. That's it for today. I'll be back soon with a new episode. Meanwhile, let's roll up our sleeves and unfuck that biz.